Amen, 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 amen. That praise and worship song was by Kalante Gavin called No Ordinary Worship. Welcome to Focus with Sean Robert Johnson. That's me, your host. As you know, I'm currently incarcerated at New Jersey State Prison in Trenton, New Jersey. So last week we launched our first episode of Seek God was a Bible study outline that I did myself with our introduction of this podcast, Focus, Followers of Christ United Stops Every Devil. And that's what we want to bring forward to y'all every time we produce an episode. So today is my first interview with my guy, my brother that I walk in Christ with. I actually met him when I first came here in 2008, one of the first two people that came to my cell and just gave me the breakdown of what to expect of being in prison. And from that very first conversation, I knew that he was a genuine guy. He turned into a very good brother of mine that, like, he's somebody that I will allow around my family. Good character. Great guy. And as we have been doing time together, it comes to a point that we made our transition in our own journey when it comes to walking with God. And I watched this man from afar, just watching, and I watched him close up of how he pours in to God on a daily basis. And he's one of my mentors that he helps me grow when it comes to God. So without further delay, I'm going to let my guy introduce himself in his own way. He knows always love, always respect from me. So here you go right here. Hey, first and above all, man, I want to thank you for having me as a guest on the Focus Podcast. I want you to know that we appreciate you and all that you do to bring awareness to the incarcerated community. And for those of you who don't know, my name is Rashid Walker. I'm currently in New Jersey State Prison serving a 60-year sentence for a crime that I did not commit. And for the last past 21 years, I've been trying to prove my innocence to a criminal justice system that refuses to admit that they got it wrong. To conceal the truth, they tried to change the facts in my case. They withheld exculpatory evidence and they gave out sweetheart plea deals. And they buried me alive under a 60-year sentence. But I serve a God. I serve a God that's able to vindicate me, that's able to deliver me and to set me free in the name of Jesus. So I just got a couple of questions that I want to ask you real quick. So tell us a little bit about your life growing up. Yeah, yeah. I'm from a small town in New Jersey called Passaic. I'm the oldest of 10. I have three brothers, six sisters, so you can imagine what it was like growing up for me. My mom made sure I excelled academically. I mean, up until the 10th grade, I was an honor student until things kind of went downhill. Athletically, I excelled as well. I played point guard all the way up until my freshman year in high school. I played every position on a baseball team with the exception of catcher and also played quarterback in football. See, my dad kind of used the disciplines of sports to instill some real life principles in me like integrity, communication, leadership, persistence, focus. So, yeah, I would, I would say my upbringing was fairly traditional. Tell us a little bit how old you were the first time someone was evangelizing God's word to you. Well, you know, I grew up in a God fearing family. So I was familiar with the gospel message, but it didn't really register or resonate with me until I landed in prison. So many brothers would share the gospel with me. Reverend Thompson, Brother Marco Troutman, Sammy Moore, Jesse Hampton, and a few other brothers. Man, they wouldn't stop telling me how much God loves me and wants to be in a relationship with me. If I would just believe that Jesus died and God raised him from the dead, I'll be saved. I'll be saved from the penalties of my sins, and he'll give me the gift of eternal life. And they was like, Rashid, there's nothing like it. You've tried everything. You've ran the streets. You sold drugs. You gang You womanized. You did whatever you wanted to do with your life. Now just put your faith in God and watch what he does with your life. And to be honest with you, they were right. 
every last one of those guys was right. And I want to thank them from the bottom of my heart for never giving up on me. So if any of them brothers listening, from Reverend Thompson to Brother Marco, Sammy Moore, Jesse Hampton, I want to thank y'all brothers for never giving up on me and reassuring me how much God loves me, man. I appreciate y'all so much for that. And I just pray that y'all would be encouraged and blessed in all y'all endeavors as well. Tell us a little bit about when you were saved. Tell us a little bit about since you have been saved, how have your walk with God been going this far? Yeah, I confessed Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior in 2008. But my conversion experience occurred on December 25th, 2008 on the West Compound, 2 right, 177 cell. Man, I remember it like yesterday. I was in a dialogue with God in the spirit. He said, Rashid, you're going to have to trust me. If you follow me, I'll deliver you. Yes, there will be times of adversity, but I'll protect you. I'll keep you and I'll bless you. When I stood up from prayer, one of the homeboys was at the cell door. He asked if I was good. I said, yeah, 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 I'm good. He asked me if I was still banging. I said, nah, man, I'm done, man. I can't do no more gang banging. He said, we been knew that. We were just waiting for you to say it. <laughs> See, so I spoke to a few of the homeboys. Everybody understood. I just wanted to put the life behind me and serve my God, man. And for the most part, they gave me their blessings to walk away that day. And I tell that story to praise God, but also to encourage another brother that might be listening, standing at the fork in the road between righteousness and unrighteousness. I want you to know that the Bible says, choose you this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. I want you to put your trust in God, man. Choose righteousness, and he'll be with you all the way through. Oh, man. Since I've been saved, I've been blessed. Yeah, there's been some tough times for sure, but I've been blessed. I've been trained, developed, mentored by a great man of God. I have a master's degree in divinity. I'm a licensed minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I lead a congregation of 250 men that praise and worship God in the way that the world would least expect, given the circumstances we find ourselves in. I preach weekly sermons. I teach weekly Bible studies. Man, serving God in this capacity is a blessing. I am blessed. Tell us a little bit about what you are currently accomplishing in life that you give God the glory for helping you do. Everything I'm able to accomplish, I give God the glory for. Along with the ministerial accomplishments, man, I've been blessed to start a few businesses as well. One of them is an online apparel store, which can be found at RhodesGold.MyShopify.com. The correct spelling on that is R-H-O-D-E-S-G-O-L-D dot M-Y-S-H-O-P-I-F-Y dot com rolesgold.myshopify.com another business that I'm silent partner in is a catering company called Can I Eat you can check it out on IG at K-E-N underscore I underscore E-A-T Can I Eat we specialize in all kinds of events so when you get some time check it out and lastly I'm also part owner of All In Investment Groups All In Investment Group has the motto of always expect greatness and when you always expect greatness you understand that your greatness is not limited to your location but your greatness is based on the level of determination that you operate in in order to accomplish your goal right and I want you to know that wherever you are man if you got some kind of business plan some kind of idea that God has dropped in your spirit man pursue it with every ounce of your being and he will bring it to pass and God deserves all the glory and honor for all that we are able to accomplish tell us about your favorite book in the bible the gospel according to saint john because it inspires faith in jesus christ as the son of god tell us about your favorite scripture and give me one thing from you to tell god right now what would it be oh man i have a few favorite scriptures but right now, I'm standing on Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, which says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Luke 2, 49. How is it that ye sought me? 
Wish ye not that I must be about my father's business? And Acts chapter 12, one, verse 1 through 11, when you get some time, check it out. That's fairly extensive, but it blessed my life every morning. If I could tell God one thing right now, I would tell him that I know all things work together for the good to them that love him and to them who are called according to his purpose. So whatever the plan is for me, I'll do it. Because I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So as I wait on him to deliver me from captivity, please continue to use me for your glory. So it was great talking to you, my God, Minister Rashid. is always love and it's definitely always a pleasure. And I'm always going to have an open invite for you to come up here at any given time to just chop it up with you. So before I go any more, I'm going to turn it over to Minister Rashid where he's about to give us a powerful sermon. Uh, first and above all, I want to give all glory and honor to God because only he, he alone is worthy. I want to acknowledge my spiritual father, my mentor, my pastor, and I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge my nip brother, Minister Dewan. And to all of the brothers who's listening, I pray that God will bless you in a great and mighty way. If I could get you to open your Bibles to the gospel in the St. Matthew chapter 21 and read for your own hearing verses one through nine. Today, I want to talk to you through a sermon that I've entitled, No Ordinary Worship. No Ordinary Worship. Today is Palm Sunday. The reason Palm Sunday is so significant is because it is the first day of the most solemn yet celebratory week in the Christian faith. On this day, while the Jews drew nigh unto Jerusalem to prepare themselves for the Feast of Passover, Jesus drew nigh unto Jerusalem to prepare himself to be the Passover. While the Jews were going to Jerusalem to honor tradition, Jesus was going to Jerusalem to fulfill tradition. And what's so interesting about this juxtaposition is how people can be going in the same direction, arrive at the same destination, but for different reasons. See, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were going in the same direction as Jesus and arrived at the same destination but for different reasons. The chief priests and the scribes were going in the same direction as Jesus and arrived at the same destination as Jesus, but for different reasons. Judas Iscariot was going in the same direction as Jesus, arrived at the same destination as Jesus, but for different reasons. See, there are people in our lives right now that's going in the same direction as us, arriving at the same destination as us, but for different reasons. See, some people are going in the same direction as us to overcome a life that has been stricken by poverty and restricted to senseless violence. Same direction different reason. Some people are going in the same direction as us to overcome a life of minimal opportunities and misguided influences. Same direction, different reason. Some people are going in the same direction as us to gain access to power and influence, position and prestige, provision and protection. Same direction, different reason. There's also people going in the same direction as you that's watching everything you do. There's people going in the same direction as you that has already started plotting on you. There's people going in the same direction as you that have already agreed to betray you. Same direction, different reason. Jesus and the Jews were going in the same direction and arrived at the same destination for different reasons. The Jews were going to Jerusalem to honor the tradition of the past. Jesus was going to Jerusalem to transform the present for the future. There is a difference between tradition and transformation. Tradition is the path of a culture from generation to generation through a set of customs meant to be viewed as precedents to influence the present. Transformation is the noticeable change of something or someone in form, appearance, nature, and condition. The more people want things to stay the same, the more Jesus wants things to change. 
Jesus wanted to change the condition of the dumb, deaf, and blind, the lame, hope, and wither. Jesus wanted to change our sin nature into a divine nature. Jesus wanted to change the appearance of our natural man into our spiritual man. Jesus wanted to change the form of godliness that lacked the power thereof into a form of godliness that was empowered by the spirit thereof. And in order to make a change, Jesus had to make a sacrifice. He was willing to make that sacrifice. The Bible says when the disciples came to the revelation that he was Jesus Christ, the Messiah, from that time forth, he began to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things at the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Now, Peter was going in the same direction as Jesus, but didn't understand the reason Jesus was willing to make this sacrifice. Jesus going up to Jerusalem took the 12 disciples apart in the way and said unto them, behold, we go up to Jerusalem and the son of man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests and unto the scribes and they shall condemn him to death and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him. And the third day he would rise again. James and John was going in the same direction as Jesus, but they cared more about their position in his kingdom than they did about his sacrifice. Everybody want change. Nobody want to make the sacrifice. We can't change nothing in our lives without first making the sacrifice. We can't change our environment until we sacrifice some associates, some friends, some relationships, some family members. We can't change our position until we take some jobs we wouldn't normally take, do some assignments we wouldn't normally do, save some paychecks we wouldn't normally save, pay some bills we wouldn't normally pay, drive some cars we wouldn't normally drive. Wear some clothes we wouldn't normally wear. Eat some food we wouldn't normally eat. In order to make change, we have to make sacrifice. And I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. The Bible says obedience is better than sacrifice. And you're right. The Bible does say obedience is better than sacrifice. The reason obedience is better than sacrifice is because when you make a sacrifice, you are giving something or someone else up for you. But when you obey God, you are sacrificing yourself for him. And Jesus being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. See, Jesus' obedience to carrying out God's plan made himself sacrifice himself for us. And there's no way around it. In order for change to break out in our lives, we have to present ourselves as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. Jesus was going to Jerusalem to sacrifice himself for the change he wanted to see. Are you willing to sacrifice your wants and your desires for the change you want to see? Are you willing to sacrifice your time and your energy for the change you want to see? Are you willing to sacrifice your contacts and resources for the change you want to see? We are all going in the same direction as Jesus, arriving at the same destination as Jesus, looking for the change that we want to see. See, And some of us are his disciples. Some of us are a part of the crowd. Some of us just came to a common place. Whatever the case may be, this Palm Sunday is no ordinary worship experience. Upon Jesus' arrival at Bethphage, he sent two disciples saying unto them, go into the village over against you. And straightway ye shall find a donkey tied and a coat with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, ye shall say, the Lord have need of them. And straightway he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Behold, thy king cometh unto me and sitting on a donkey. This is where it get interesting. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. And brought the donkey and the coat and put on them their clothes and they set Jesus thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. See, based on our scripture text, I would suggest that there was three types of worship occurring during this event. 
let's call the first type of worship disciple worship. Let's call the second type of worship crowd worship. Let's call the third type of worship uncommon worship. See, disciple worship is the type of worship rendered unto God that requires one to obey God's commands, even when they don't understand the reason why he's commanded them to do what he's commanded them to do. Disciple worship is the type of worship that requires one to sacrifice something for God without measuring the significance or the value of the thing that's being sacrificed. You may not understand why God commanded you to stay on a Daniel fast from January 1st to Resurrection Sunday. All you know is he commanded you to do it and you obeyed his command. That's disciple worship. In the middle of that Daniel fast, your food package came rather than break the fast. You gave the food package away because because obeying God commands means more to you than the value of a food package. That's disciple worship. Jesus commanded the disciples to go into a village, untie somebody else's donkey and coat, and bring them to him. And the disciples did as Jesus commanded him. That's disciple worship. See, obedience mixed with sacrifice makes disciple worship. Crowd worship is the type of worship that's inspired by disciple worship. Crowd worship is formed by people watching other people worshiping God until they get so overwhelmed by the spirit that they join in the worship by saying and doing what they see other people do. Crowd worship is a disorganized thronging or pressing through a mass group of people to get to what you're trying to get to. Uh, the Bible says four friends carrying a man sick of posy got caught up in the midst of crowd worship. They couldn't come near Jesus for the press, so they uncovered the roof where he was and let down the bed wherein the sick of palsy lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said, arise, take up thy bed and go into thine own house. That's crowd worship. Let me tell you a story about a woman with an issue. She had it 12 long years. She didn't know what to do. She heard about a man coming through her town in order to press through the crowd. She fell to her knees and crawled on the ground. And she said, if I could only touch the hem of his garment, I shall be whole. After she pressed through the crowd, Jesus said unto her daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. That's crowd worship. When a very great multitude saw Jesus coming on a donkey, they became so overwhelmed by what they were seeing and hearing that they joined in the worship and spread their garments in the way. Other people that was a part of the crowd cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. Those garments were a symbol of the joy of God's salvation. Salvation and those palm branches were symbols of God's victory being strawed and spread in the way. See, when you mix your faith with your press, you make crowd worship. Uncommon worship is the type of worship that brings commonplace worship into uncommon places. It's common to worship God in band practice. It's common to worship God in choir rehearsal. It's common to worship God in prayer service. It's common to worship God in worship service. I wonder what would happen if we brought this commonplace worship with us out of the sanctuary and released it in every area of our lives. I wonder what would happen if we released commonplace worship at our jobs. I wonder what would happen if we released commonplace worship at the bank. I wonder what would happen if we released commonplace worship at a food pantry feeding the homeless. I wonder what would happen if we released commonplace worship at the rehab center. I wonder what would happen if we released commonplace worship at the hospital. I wonder what would happen if we brought this commonplace worship with us out of the sanctuary and released it in uncommon places. I wonder what would happen if we released this commonplace worship all throughout the prison. I wonder what would happen if we released this commonplace worship at every prosecutor's office, every police Police department. See, uncommon worship is the type of worship that brings commonplace worship into uncommon places. Uncommon worship is no ordinary worship. It requires you to give all that you have in this very moment to God. If all you have is a shout, then give it to God. If all you have is a clap, then give it to God. If all you have is a lap, then give it to God. If all you have is a cry or a yell, give it to God this very moment because this is no ordinary worship. When you mix disciple worship with crowd worship and uncommon worship, you make no ordinary 
military worship, when you mix obedience and sacrifice, faith impressed with joy and victory, you make no ordinary worship. There was a multitude or a crowd of people in front of Jesus in a multitude or a crowd of people following Jesus, crying and saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. This was uncommon worship. They weren't in a temple worshiping God. They weren't in a synagogue worshiping God. They weren't in a believer's house worshiping God. They were walking through the city of Jerusalem worshiping God for all to see. Everybody that was going in the same direction as Jesus, arriving at the same destination as Jesus, for whatever reason, became so overwhelmed by what they were experiencing that they started worshiping Jesus. Today is the day we put every Pharisee and Sadducee Judas Iscariot in our lives on notice. Whatever your reason is for coming here, do what you got to do and do it quickly because I got to worship my God. Today is the day we tell every person in our lives that don't understand the reason why we're making the sacrifices for God to get behind us because we got to worship our God. Today is the day we tell every person in our lives that put their own ambitions above and before God's plan for our lives that they know not what they ask for and they are not able to drink from the cup that we are called to drink from or be baptized with the baptism that we are baptized with. So get out of my way because I got to worship my God. There is no ordinary worship in worshiping our God. The God I serve is greater than the ordinary. So I'm going to give him all that I have in this moment. This is no ordinary worship. God be the glory. That right there was a powerful sermon from our own minister, Rashid. That's my God. That's my brother. It's always love. And I just hope that everybody listening to this podcast today takes something out of what he just gave in the sermon and just continue to just grow and grow in God in your own walk. And, you know, each episode we're going to have somebody different doing something differently. So, this is just the first interview that I'm proud of. And as you know, the podcast focus stands for followers of Christ United Stops Every Devil. And followers of Christ upset Satan's efforts daily. So by doing this, make sure that you got your armor of God on at all times. And if you don't know where you can find that at, you can find it in the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, verse 10 through 18. And it goes like this. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints so continue to put that thing in your spirit and let's end this thing with a prayer dear heavenly father lord of lord kings of kings thank you for us having this time today of just going forth with your word in this episode powerful sermon from minister rashid Continue to just pour in him in his life. Bless him in every way possible. And everybody that is listening, whatever we come to you for as we seek you, God, continue to help us grow in our walk with you. Continue to help us stay with that armor of God on so that we can be shielded against the devil. Give us healing, give us blessings, and give us everything we need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So. I thank y'all for tuning in to this episode and tune in for the next one. It's definitely coming. And to God be the glory.